Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the latest installment in the Ransom Center's Collection Connection series. Our discussion today will focus on authors and presidential inaugurations. I'm Megan Barnard, the Ransom Center's Associate Director for Administration and Curatorial Affairs. Thank you all so much for joining us um, for this conversation this afternoon. If you haven't seen our previous Collection Connections programs, you can find videos on the Ransom Center's YouTube channel. And to be sure that you don't miss future Ransom Center events, I hope you'll consider following the Ransom Center through our various social media outlets. I'm delighted and so fortunate to be joined in conversation today by Jeremy Surrey, who holds the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs and is a professor of history and public affairs here at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Suri is the author and editor of 10 books about contemporary politics and foreign policy, including The Impossible Presidency, The Rise and Fall of America's Highest Office. You've likely seen his writings in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other outlets where he's published frequently. He also hosts the excellent weekly podcast, This is Democracy, which brings together diverse voices to talk about our democracy trying to make sense of current challenges while thinking through positive ways to move forward. And each episode typically opens with a poem from his son. Hi, Jeremy. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to talk with you today. I'm so excited about this. And thank you for including me and for sponsoring this event. Oh, thank you. We're so glad to have you. On the heels of last week's uh, inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, we're going to look today at two items from the Ransom Center's collections that encourage us to think about the intersection of literature and politics, particularly with regard to presidential inaugural ceremonies. We'll be sure to reserve a few minutes at the end of the program for questions from those of you watching today. And to that end, feel free to post questions in the comments field throughout the discussion. And before we get started, I wanna take a moment to thank my colleagues at the Ransom Center who've been working behind the scenes to make this program possible, including Lisa Pulsifer, our head of public programs and education, Doug Newell, our senior media support technician, and Randy Ragsdale, our communications and marketing manager. Let's start with a little background about the two items from the Ransom Center's collections we'll be discussing today. The first is from the Ransom Center's John Steinbeck collection, and it's a handwritten draft of brief remarks John Steinbeck prepared for Lyndon Johnson's inaugural address on January 20th, 1965. The second item comes from the Center's papers of poet Miller Williams. Williams was invited by President Bill Clinton to write and read a poem for the president's second inauguration on January 20th, 1997. We'll take a look at a copy of the poem that Miller Williams read from at that inaugural ceremony. And let's begin our discussion with the Steinbeck item. Now, American writer John Steinbeck was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1962, and he had a close association with Lyndon Johnson prior to the 1965 inauguration. Steinbeck's wife, Elaine, first met Lady Bird Johnson when they were both students here at the University of Texas in the early 1930s. Uh, but Lyndon Johnson and John Steinbeck first met in late 1963, when the Steinbecks attended a White House dinner following their return from a trip to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe as part of a cultural exchange program for the US Information Agency. The Johnsons and the Steinbecks quickly became friends, and the Steinbecks visited the Johnsons several times at the White House and at Camp David. In 1964, Johnson enlisted Steinbeck's help in preparing the speech he gave at the Democratic um, Convention when Johnson accepted the party's nomination for president. And months later, Eric F. Goldman, a historian and professor at Princeton who was working at the time as a special consultant to President Johnson, reached out to Steinbeck for help with the president's inaugural address in 1965. And we have in the Ransom Center's Steinbeck collection, a four page handwritten rough draft of the remarks Steinbeck prepared. And you can see one of those pages here. The remarks are rather brief and included with the speech is a draft of the cover letter that Steinbeck sent to Goldman. The request for help must have come on a pretty short timeline because Steinbeck notes in his letter to Goldman, quote, this is the best I can do in the time given me. Do anything you want if you use it anonymously. 
He goes on to note, of course, we both know it will probably not be used, and that's all right, too. As Steinbeck predicted, much of his text was not included in LBJ's actual inaugural address, but some of Steinbeck's words and sentiments did make it into the final version. Jeremy, why do you think it might have been important at that moment in history for Lyndon Johnson and his advisor, Eric Goldman, to call upon Steinbeck, a Nobel Prize winning writer, to help craft this inaugural address? Well, it's a, it's a great question, Megan. I think uh, there was no author in the second half of the 20th century who did more to bring to life uh, the experiences of poor Americans, suffering Americans, than John Steinbeck. He did this through so many of his novels and short stories. And uh, what Lyndon Johnson was trying to do in 1965 is he was launching the Great Society. Uh, he was trying to do what Franklin Roosevelt had done in 1933. He was trying to reach out to the poor the suffering, uh, white and black and uh, Latino in the, in the United States. And he was looking for the words to do that. And he knew that many in those communities didn't see Lyndon Johnson because of his long Senate career and his Texas background. They didn't see him as always a friend of the dispossessed. And so he was looking in his inaugural address, Lyndon Johnson was to find the words to help those citizens realize that he empathized and connected with them and he turned through Eric Goldman to the master, to John Steinbeck. It, it makes a lot of sense to turn there. Great, thank you. Let's look closely at a portion of Steinbeck's draft that was mostly included in LBJ's speech. So we can see it here. Um, and as you can see, Steinbeck writes, the great society as I see it is not the fixed and sterile polity of the bees, nor the ordered and changeless battalions of the ants. It is the miracle of becoming, always becoming, trying, probing, failing, resting, and trying again, but always gaining a little, perfectible, but not perfect. In Johnson's speech, this section reads, I do not believe that the Great Society is the ordered, changeless, and sterile battalion of the ants. It is the excitement of becoming, always becoming, trying, probing, falling, resting, and trying again, but always trying and always gaining. Jeremy, what do you think it is about these lines that resonated with Johnson? Well, I think these lines uh, take the experience of so many people and they universalize them. And they connect them to not just an experience across races and regions, but also across time. Uh, and that we are experiencing in the fabric of time, Lyndon Johnson was trying to argue, many of the challenges we have faced in the past and we can learn from that. And, and I think that's what this poetry does. It, it, it offers uh, almost a, a historical lesson without it sounding like a historical lesson. <laughs> I think that's why these words were taken from, from Steinbeck and used in the, in the inauguration. Great. You know, when I was watching the inaugural ceremony last week, I had this speech on my mind as I watched the president deliver his inaugural address. And I was struck by how several of Steinbeck's words and sentiments could be heard in President Biden's speech. Um, for example, in Steinbeck's draft, he refers several times to Americans as restless. Um, Steinbeck writes as an example, restless and impatient we are. And Biden noted in his speech, we look ahead in our uniquely American way, restless, bold, optimistic. I suppose there's a sort of genre of inaugural addresses. Is there a universality to these speeches and some of the rhetorical choices made in them that's especially suitable for the start of a president's term in office? I, I think there is, I think, and I think it's serious. I don't think it's just window dressing or marketing. I think what an inauguration allows is a president, which is a pretty unique position. It's not a prime minister. This is someone who has been elected by the country as a whole, who oversees the executive branch, who is the only person who can speak for the whole country. It allows that individual to reach deeper into what I think uh, President Biden effectively called the soul of America. And I think that's what these inaugural addresses really are. Uh, they're not State of the Union addresses, which are addresses where the president gives a laundry list of uh, his programs and the things that he wants to pass. No, these are short addresses that are designed usually after a divisive election. Most of our elections are divisive. Uh, they're designed to try to bring people together, not to make the differences go away, but to say, in spite of our differences, there are still things we share. And these words, restlessness, 
right? Impatient. Uh, these are common American uh, qualities, things that we see as things that define us and that make us the uh, growing, prosperous people that we hope to be. And so I think that's what you see in these recurring addresses. And the better the address, the better it is at reaching deep and finding a few words to make us all think across our party lines and across our regions. That's the aspiration. Great. Let's look now at Miller Williams's poem of History and Hope, which Williams wrote for President Bill Clinton's second inauguration. So you can see here from Williams's archive is the copy that Miller Williams read from outside the Capitol building on January 20th, 1997. And as you can see, he even marked inflections and pauses to help him through the reading. Um, only six poets have read at official presidential inaugural ceremonies, starting with Robert Frost, who read at John F. Kennedy's inauguration, Maya Angelou and Miller Williams read at Bill Clinton's first and second inaugurations, respectively, Elizabeth Alexander um, at Barack Obama's first inauguration and Richard Blanco at Obama's second, and now Amanda Gorman read at our most recent inauguration last week. Why do you think these presidents chose to include poetry as a part of their inaugural ceremonies? Or I guess to phrase it differently, how does having a poet read at an inauguration influence or impact the event? I think the way to think about an inauguration like the one we just witnessed on January 20th is, is it's a moment of theater in the most serious way, right? It's Shakespearean, <laughs> it's you have a rival sitting near one another on the dais, you have citizens, usually you have a crowd. This year we had people watching, more watching than ever before. And there's an effort to perform the unity we hope to see. And I think for many presidents, particularly for Democrats, who have been the only ones who have chosen poets to speak at their inaugurations, every one of those examples was a Democratic president, for them, poetry offers that opportunity to include those who might not be included otherwise, because poetry often speaks of those parts of our experience that often, often aren't written about. They don't show up in our economic statistics. They might not show up in the annual reports of our companies. Uh, and the poet puts to words what people feel but are not in their words generally. And so it's a way to connect that theater. It's what we do see in Shakespeare, right? We go to Shakespeare and we feel things we didn't feel before and we find words for them. And then we find ourselves quoting Hamlet later on to express our indecisiveness to be or not to be or whatever it is. Um, and I think the poet is trying to provide some of the playwriting that the president needs to provide that performance to an audience. Uh, the president is trying to get that audience to feel connected and feel actualized, feel like its words, its feelings are being heard on the stage of the inauguration in a way they wouldn't otherwise. And for Democrats, that's particularly important. And that's what the, the poetry is about. That's what the music is about. Uh, it's all a theater performance. And we as the audience are supposed to be moved by it. Yeah, absolutely. During the opening of Biden's inaugural, inaugural address last week, I was struck by his use of the phrase of history and hope, which of course is the title Miller Williams gave to his inaugural poem. President Biden noted in his speech, this is democracy's day, a day of history and hope of renewal and resolve through a crucible for the ages. Why might these words of history and hope be especially powerful for a presidential inauguration? Well, every inauguration offers a chance to start again. We know we don't start with a blank slate. We always inherit problems. We always inherit challenges, uh, but there's reason to hope. And in fact, the more difficult the election, the more difficult the problem, the more we need hope. Uh, and actually the founders, that's one of the things they wanted the president to provide the country. They wanted the president to be someone who could remind the country that there are possibilities even in our darkest in our dark, darkest days. And I think the history and, and Miller Williams poem captures this as did, I thought, uh, Joe Biden's statement this year. It, the history is for us to see that we've been through difficulty before. And we can have hope today because we managed to make our way through and find hope in the past. And in that sense, every inauguration, every poet at an inauguration, every speaker at an inauguration is part of an evolving fabric an evolving chronology in our history. And so the reference to history and hope is to help us to see that, to take us out of our worries and our partisanship of the moment 
and see ourselves as part of a longer lineage that has, of course, its tragedy and suffering, but has also its, its hope in it. And that's where the renewal comes. That's where the resolve comes. And, and one other uh, word that, that, that I think comes up all the time is union, right? That, that we are something larger than ourselves. And uh, that's, that's maybe the preachy part, but I think that's, that's part of the purpose of, of this moment. Yeah, and this whole idea of unity was, you know, the theme of of this inauguration, and I think of many uh, many past inaugurations as well. So a commonality um, that we can see between Miller Williams' poem and the very powerful poem that an Amanda Gorman read last week is the strong use of opposition. Um, in Williams's poem, we see this especially in the stanza at the top of the second page with people coming together and people falling apart, law versus chaos, learning versus ignorance. Amanda Gorman's poem uses similar tensions. Um, she said, you know, we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. Why might the tensions created in this rhetorical bringing together of differences be especially powerful for a poem read at a presidential inauguration? Well, I love this question because I think it gets at what for a historian makes the United States the United States. We are a huge pluralistic country. Uh, we are not a, a small island. We are a huge pluralistic country filled with people from all over the place. And we have always from the founding been divided by different parties in different regions. And what these poems do, what Amanda Gorman did so beautifully, what Miller Williams does here, is instead of denying those differences, which is unpersuasive, they're bathing in them. They're bathing in these differences, and they're helping us to see that these differences can also connect us. This really echoes one of the first most important inaugural addresses, Thomas Jefferson's in 1801, after a very difficult election between Federalists and Republicans, the first transition of power away from the Washington Adams Federalist. Uh, regime, Jefferson said, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. And that's what these poems are saying, right? Uh, these oppositions, we, we're a bit of all of them. And actually, let's not deny our differences, but let's also see our commonality in our differences, e pluribus unum, unum right? That we are united in our differences. That, that's actually the brilliance of these poems, because a poem works, it seems to me, when it speaks to you, not when it tries to make you something you aren't but it speaks to you and allows you to see in yourself something different. So I can hear these and see, yeah, you know, I'm a little bit of both of these oppositions. Maybe I'm 70, 30, <laughs> but I'm still part of both of them. And I can see myself in that. I, I think that was the brilliance of Amanda Gorman's poem and her performance. And, and if I might say what I love about this document, you know, as a historian, I love the original documents, Megan. I love that you can actually not just read this poem, but because you have this original version at the Ransom Center, we can imagine what it sounded like. Uh, we can also watch the video, but we can read, try to read it like Amelia Williams and try to understand how he was not only trying to get the right words on paper, but get them articulated the right way to make this point about union and diversity. Yes, what he wanted to stress and emphasize, where he wanted to pause. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, looking more big picture, what do you think the role is that literature or the arts more generally can and perhaps should play at an inauguration? Well, I have a lot to say about that. And I'm so excited that we have an administration now that values the arts. I think it's one of the most important thing leaders of all kinds. And I don't think you have to be a president to think in this way. You can be a community leader. You can be the leader of an institution. Uh, the arts are essential to democracy. They're who we are. If at its base, democracy is about making politics humane, making power serve people rather than people serve power. How do people express themselves? They express themselves through the arts. It's what makes us human beings. And if we're a democracy at our most important democratic moment or one of our most important moments at these inaugurations, we should be showcasing that and we should be opening that space. And what I love about poetry in particular is it's very hard to write I'm not very good at writing it. My son is very good at writing it. Um, but what poetry is, is it is democratic in the sense that you don't need a lot of stuff to actually be a poet. You can start writing, you can start expressing yourself if you've been fortunate enough to be exposed to poetry. Um, and, and it's getting across to an audience that this is something accessible. Few of us will reach the heights of the individuals we're showcasing here, but we can all be poets in our own way. We can all express ourselves. 
And, and I think that's what presidents need to unleash in our society is that kind of democratic spirit, that openness. And the arts allow us to do that better than anything else. Uh, we are at our best as a country when we are showcasing and encouraging uh, our arts. It's what makes our country what it is. It's what makes a university what it is. Uh, and, and so uh, I think it's absolutely, absolutely central to us. And uh, I'm one of many historians who would say that societies make progress. They become innovative when they're artistically rich and diverse. And the opposite is true when they aren't. If you want to see an example, compare the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The Soviet Union put more money into engineering, but they didn't have the creative arts in the way we did. I'd say we won the Cold War because we were more creative. And I'd like to see our society continue down that road. And you and I have, we've talked about the, um, the there's a great quote from John F. Kennedy about um, poetry. And he, he noted, if, if more politicians knew poetry and more poets knew politics, I'm convinced the world would be a better place in which to live. I think Kennedy was getting at a point about humility also. Uh, the arts remind us that even when we rise to these heights and people tell us, you know, and, and play the hail to the chief when we enter the room, as happens when you're president, or you never stop at a red light. I mean, one of the things I've studied is how this gets to people's heads, right? Uh, w w you, you get too full of yourself and you make mistakes. Uh, and we all know that leadership requires humility. The arts remind us of that. And I think when, when John F. Kennedy was saying that at his visit to Amherst after Robert Frost's uh, death, he was reminding his audience of that too, that the, the poets are sometimes also the Cassandras who help us to see our own limitations and put us, put us in, our, in our place. Uh, we might have money and weapons, but we're still flawed human beings. And the arts, I mean, again, back to Shakespeare, right? <laughs> the, the, and Greek tragedy that brings that out and reminds us of that every single day. And, and reminds us too, to be more empathetic. Um, so that's another thing that we've, we've talked about a lot that, um, that we, can see literature can really add to um, the political. Um, it, it, it helps us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Absolutely. Again, that's why I think Lyndon Johnson turned to John Steinbeck. Uh, we know Lyndon Johnson was not a great reader of novels. I'm sure he liked John Steinbeck's work, but it wasn't as a fanboy per se. I think it was more that Lyndon Johnson recognized, just as you said so well, Megan, that he had to convey empathy. This was what Roosevelt did so well, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and he had to do that. Johnson didn't always have the oratorical skills that a Franklin Roosevelt or a John F. Kennedy had. And so he was looking for the words to, uh, to express empathy and to feel that empathy. Interestingly, um, in Steinbeck's draft remarks, this didn't make it into um, Johnson's final speech, but um, Steinbeck um, talks about empathy as a weapon and a tool that that presidents can employ. Um, interesting way of uh, framing the use of empathy as as a weapon or tool, um, but nonetheless, it's um, it seems absolutely critical to a moment of political transition like this. Sure, sure. Well, um, being mindful of the time, I want to make sure we reserve some time for questions from the audience. So those of you watching today, if you haven't submitted questions, but you have some, please feel free to do so. And um, we'll look at, um, I'll look to see, we've got a few questions already coming in. Um, we have a question from Greg, who asks, does the Ransom Center have many John Steinbeck items? Um, yes, Greg. Um, we have a pretty significant John Steinbeck collection at the Ransom Center. Um, it fills about um, 14 document boxes. So it, it's a, a pretty rich corpus of material. And uh, much of the material that we have, it came from various sources, but quite a lot of it came from um, Steinbeck's editor and publisher. And um, there are a number of other um, important John Steinbeck collections at other universities, um, San Jose, um, there's the National Steinbeck Center um, that's in California, um, and a number of other um, institu institutions also have um, some rich Steinbeck collections, but we have wonderful materials here at the Ransom Center related to John, John Steinbeck. Um, and I encourage people to come, come to the Ransom Center, and uh, when, we're, when times are safe again and our reading room is open to the public, and um, anyone is welcome to uh, register. It's one of the great things about the Ransom Center. Um, we're very um, proud of the fact that we are open to the public. So anyone's able to go through a, a 
brief registration process, go into our reading room and request um, to see materials um, like the Steinbeck materials, and they can be brought to you. And um, our staff are always on hand, um, happy and ready to help um, help people um, have that wonderful experience of actually seeing these um, these original archival documents, which is a, a, a very powerful experience. Um, so we also have, we have a question from um, Davida. Um, the most famous inaugural address um, addresses are probably Lincoln's and Kennedy's. Um, do you think that was due to the times when they happened or the speaker's talent or the ideas? That's a great question, Davida. Um, and I would add Franklin Roosevelt's uh, 1933, right? We have nothing to fear but fear itself, right? Uh, there are a number that, that, that uh, stand out. I think it is the times. Uh, it's the way in which they captured that moment and there was a hungering for that language, but it's also how they managed to find the right poetry. It's why we remember certain poems and we don't remember others. They, they were able to put it together. Um, and these were all individuals who spent a lot of time thinking about words and had people around them and people around them, as well as the speakers who were deeply influenced by the arts. Uh, we know this is true with Abraham Lincoln and he's the only one on that list who gets two. Right, his first and second in our girls are probably the first and second best ones. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt spent a lot of time uh, trying to find the right phrases. Uh, that was something he spent a lot of time on, uh, and as did John Kennedy as well. So I think it's a combination of the moment and the inclination and understanding of the speaker. I will say there are presidents like Bill Clinton who tried really hard to replicate that and couldn't. And I think some of the limitations that someone like Bill Clinton faced were one, the circumstances they were in, but also Perhaps uh, if you're trying to be poetic too hard, if you're trying to have a lasting line, you don't do it. I think it's there's something about stepping back and trying to tell a story and working your way toward the language rather than trying to start out with a memorable line. I think the lines we think will be memorable don't end up being memorable. And a good follow up question uh, we have from Rachel, who asks, um, what is your favorite inaugural address of all time? Oh, uh, well, my favorite is Lincoln's second inaugural, by far, uh, because what he does, he's so uh, crafty in a very short address. Uh, I read it to students at the end of a lecture every year. It's very short. You can read it at the Lincoln Memorial very quickly, the Gettysburg Address on one side, the second inaugural on the other. Uh, what he does is not only put into words what the Civil War was about, he manages, and this is really relevant for our time today, he manages to condemn slavery and condemn slaveholders without making it about us versus them. Instead, he turns slavery into a collective cancer. You know, every drop of blood uh, drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. And he brings Americans together in spite of their differences over slavery to see that they all were in a sense contributors to slavery and now have to move on as a new country and we can start again. And, and that rhetorical shift, it's not just the poetry of it, reframing how people think of the war. He doesn't apologize or excuse the evils of slavery, but he doesn't say, I won, they lost, they have to do what I say. Instead, he brings people together. That's an incredibly powerful move. And it's so short, it's so concise and every word matters. That's, that, that to me is the gold standard. Great. Well, thank you all so much um, for taking the time this afternoon to join us in this conversation. And I especially wanna thank Dr. Jeremy Surrey for taking part in the discussion and for sharing such um, interesting insights. Um, on Thursday, February 18th, um, I hope you'll join the Ransom Center online for our next event when Dr. Sarah Neville will speak about herbals great and small, commodifying botany in early modern England for our annual Forsheimer lecture. Jeremy, thanks again so much for sharing in this conversation. Um, it's been a real pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, but really fascinating and wonderful to talk with you about this subject of authors and presidential inaugurations. Thank you for all your great insights. Well, and Megan, thank you for organizing this and thank you to you and all the other archivists at the Ransom Center. You make it possible for us as historians to do our work and for us to remember and learn from the past. It's so important. And after this difficult moment we've been through the last few years, we need you more than ever. So thank you for your heroic work. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. And thanks everyone for watching today. Please take care.